false. False teachers, false teachings, those kinds of things. There's some very interesting things that I want to look at uh, from a, that a lot of uh, popular speakers have said, things people like Joyce Meyer and whatnot, and I just want to look at some of those ideas. And uh, so just some really interesting ideas because I, I don't feel like they're really addressed that much. So tonight I just kind of want to segue from talking about those white lies into talking more specifically about the false. And we'll continue looking at Matthew 7 tonight. Um, so just a real quick recap of the last thing we were looking at, because it was like, I think it was like a month ago now. Let's see, last week was canceled, the week before that was a movie, the week before that was... We did watch the seminar. The seminar. The sex trafficking seminar. Oh, yes. So, or actually, I guess it was human trafficking, which included sex trafficking. Uh, so I guess it was four, four weeks ago. And that one might have been canceled, too. So we're talking about like a month ago. This is so this recap's kind of necessary. Um, one of the ideas that, that we get and which is totally false is the fake has no power. You can tell what's real and what's fake by whether it has power to it or not. That's just completely false. Um, another idea with, that kind of goes real similar to this is I can tell if something's fake. Like um, you know, if a person's fake, if a speaker's fake, if whatever, I, I can just tell. And this is this is a. a I, I know it's hard for us to admit to ourselves that we could be deceived and we could be wrong, but the truth is we really don't know, like, a lot of times we judge it based on how well their presentation is or, you know, that kind of stuff, what what I feel uh, of them, you know, if I like somebody that means they must be good, that kind of stuff, and it, a lot of times, no, we don't have a easy, real easy time telling the fake. Um, so one of the things we're looking at is, you know, okay, um, surely if, if something has power to it, then it must be from God. Well, even the Antichrist will use miracles. So, I mean, no, that's not really a, a good test of whether something is real or fake. Um, if people knew when they were being deceived, they wouldn't be deceived by definition. So that means that, yes, you can, in fact, be deceived. Something I want, I want you to think seriously about is, is Jesus. How do we know that Jesus was who he said he was? Well, a lot of people would say because of his miracles. Miracles are not the sign of what's real. So I want you guys to think about that. Um, because, I mean, if Jesus was fake, which I'm not saying, obviously I don't believe that Jesus was fake. But I'm saying if he was fake, that is what he would have done, try to wow people with miracles. So, uh, the Fake uh, prophets, fake teachers. These are people that you like to like. They're not pale faced demons. They don't look like they don't look like they don't belong. These are people that look like they fit. They they look real nice. They they look the part. Oftentimes they'll they'll really pull you in with the charismatic attitude. They're they used to manipulating people a lot of times. So they just have the, this 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 way about them that makes you feel important. Um, and we looked at the way that you can tell them by their fruit, which. We looked at a couple different ways this can apply. Number one, the almost obvious way, what they produce. What is the what is the result of their ministry, the result of their life, the result of that? Um, a lot of people, for instance, there were a lot of false prophets going on last year uh, about uh, President Trump. And, you know, what would happen with the election and all that? Obviously, they were wrong. Um, and what was the result of, of them prophesying? Well, first off, they encouraged people worshiping a man, President Trump. That was a big red flag that should have t told people, no, this is not bringing glory to God. This is bringing glory to a man. This is not good. Um, and then they brought shame to, to, to God because they said something was from God, and then it wasn't from God. So people took it as a way of God being wrong rather than those people being false. So what, what, what do they produce? Next up, the effect of them being there. When, when they were there, were they encouraging people to be patient and kind and gentle? Or were they encouraging people to, you know, start a, a, to war against the Democrat or demon rats? You know, you see what I mean? Like there was this, this whole attitude that was going along with it. What was the effect of them being there? And then third off, how, um, how did they act and talk? So uh, obviously they, they may hide it well, but still, you can tell them by their fruit. When, when they're doing stuff, listen to, to not just what they say, but the way that they say it. Are these people trying to manipulate? Are these people trying to kind of connive? Um, so let's look and continue to look at Matthew 7. We'll start in verse 21 tonight. We finished verse 20 a month ago, so... Took us a month to get through a verse. No, I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. Um, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. Okay, so I want you to notice this. First, he talks about what people say. 
but the one who does the will of my Father. Okay, now he's talking about actions. The one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven will enter. Okay, so okay, so it's about our works then. Well, now listen to what he says now. Many will say to me on that day, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name? Did we not do something? And in your name cast out demons, we did something. And in your name perform many miracles. So after saying, he just said, those who do the will of my Father, and then he mentioned three things that they did, and then he still says this, and then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Leave me, you who practice lawlessness. Did you hear what he just said? Jesus said, okay, there's going to be these people who say this, but it's not what you say, it's what you do. So they're going to say, well, didn't we do these things? And he's going to say, I never knew you. So there's a very, very important kind of... Um, Progression of thought here, and we're gonna we're gonna try to analyze the crap out of this. First off, it's not about the show that they put on. That's a very very important point because you cannot tell if someone is real or fake based on how they appear. Okay, let's look at this again. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. So it's not about their appearance. God knows the real from the fake. Sometimes the prideful. Now now let me break this into into pieces. First off, God knows the real from the fake. If you look back, and then I will declare them, I never knew you. So although you had people fooled, I never knew you. So God is able to distinguish truth from the fake. So that that now let's go to that second part of that sentence. Sometimes the prideful, super spiritual people will fool themselves. It is possible to be so self-righteous and so huffed up on your own goodness that you can actually fool yourself and not even realize that you're fooling yourself. A lot of times people will be using the gifts of the Spirit, and they'll start off genuine. But then over time, they stop reading the Bible, they stop praying, they start relying on themselves. I'm, I'm good, and God picked me because I'm better than other people. And so then they'll start kind of substituting where it's not really a word from God until eventually it's, it's a word from them. You know what I mean? It's just this gradual. It's like uh, in, um, I believe it's uh, the book of First Kings, the prophets are talking, and this guy says, no, you just gave a false pro prophecy. And the guy says, how did the Spirit go from me to you? See, he didn't even realize. So a lot of times we get to that story and say, oh, he was always a fake prophet. It doesn't say that he was always a fake prophet. And that was seems to be one of his arguing points is, how did the Spirit go from me to you? Everybody knows that in the past I have been a real prophet. How did it go from me to you? And that, that's kind of one of his big, strong arguments there. Were you going to say something? Yeah, I don't know if this is a good example or not, but just so I can kind of wrap my head around it more. Would it be like somebody like Joel Osteen? Everything that he says is good, that looks is good, but what he does in general is very prideful and greedy. Would it be something like that? In a way, but if you listen real close to the teachings of Joel Osteen, you'll notice that it sounds good, but if you actually stop and think about it and then put it up to the Bible, you say, well, you just said this, God wants me to be happy. Okay, that sounds like a good thought. Surely God doesn't want me to be miserable. Well, then you look at the Bible and you see that the Bible's main focus isn't necessarily our happiness, it's our <laughs> obedience. And the joy that comes in obedience, even in the midst of suffering. And so then you take the image of that and you put it up to the image of Joel Osteen's portraying and you're like, eh, this, this isn't right. See what I mean? So... I think the reason that example doesn't quite reach is because the actual teachings of Joel Osteen are off. But yes, I would agree that um, that that appearance, yeah, in, in a way. When you yeah. look, when you first look at him in his church, it's like, okay. He's got he's got but the smile. Victoria and I are so happy you're with us today. And then you <laughs> Um, yeah, yeah, absolutely. But um, I think it goes a step further beyond that. It's easy to see the people on like on the big screen when they're fake. In fact, that's actually how I was going to start off tonight's lesson. I was going to show a clip of of uh, Kenneth Copeland uh, where he has the creepy looking eyes, and I was gonna I was gonna talk about the way that you know not everyone's going to look like Kenneth Copeland. <laughs> <laughs> Um, oh, I know, right? Demons! <laughs> Everyone's like, I don't believe in demonic possession, and I'm all like, have you seen Kenneth Copeland? No, I'm, I'm, I kid, I kid, I kid. Anyways, um, the, the thing is, it's, it, it's the, the, the problem is, is that we oftentimes will look at someone like Joel Osteen, and we won't stop to weigh our own hearts, and we won't stop to um, analyze the people that are in even our local church here. You see what I mean? It'll be something like it's out there. You know what I mean? Like the demons, they're out there hiding. But here we're safe. You know what I mean? And 
that's kind of something we need to always watch out for um, because anybody can be prideful. And here's something that I've noticed. Pride, pride exists in all of us in different forms. And what happens over time is that pride slowly creeps up and gets more and more powerful. And then when something happens, it'll squash it down. And it comes starts as soon as it squashed down, it gets starts going up again. It's like it's like a tank that refills itself. It's like a self filling car. Okay. <laughs> and, and so what happens to, to humble, humble that pride? Well, sometimes you address it in yourself. Sometimes somebody else addresses it in you. Sometimes you go through just a situation that's very awkward. <laughs> um, anyways, uh, yeah, it, it's, it's, it's very easy to become one of those people where your own pride kind of blinds you to yourself. Uh, and so weighing your heart obviously becomes import an important part. Uh, signs and wonders are not the proof. Uh, a prophecy from a false prophet may actually come true. Um, a demonic presence may actually be able to tell, the, to tell the future. How is that possible? I don't know. Did God reveal it to the demon? I, I don't know. Like I, I have no idea how that works. But I know that um, just because somebody gives a prophecy that's, that's real doesn't mean that they are sent from God. Um, Sorry, I thought I saw something. Um, it's about your relationship with Jesus, not experiences. That's something that's really emphasized today in, in modern Christianity is experiences. It's all experience-based, how it makes you feel. But that's not really the truth. Um, it's not It's not about your perfection. Can you be good enough? Can you do everything just right? And I mean, as a kid, this was my, my sole thing. I, I tried to do everything as perfect as humanly possible. I, I did better than, than most anybody that I know on most everything. I was just, I was perfect. And you know what, what, what the thing is? I was never good enough in my own eyes and in anybody else's eyes. No matter how good I did, no matter how hard I pushed myself, I was never good enough. I was never perfect. You see what I'm saying? No matter how hard you try, you can never attain that. So how perfect is good enough? The only person who thinks that they're actually perfect are prideful people who lie to themselves. That's it. You will always not measure up to that. So thank God it's not about your perfection. Um, it's not about miracles. It's not about appearance or status or speeches. It's not about any of those things. And uh, that's a very troubling thing to look at. But when, when, when we go back and read this again, pay attention. I'll read it again and, and just think about the things that I just said, okay? Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. But the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven will enter. Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, we, we did do the will of the Father. We did not uh, did we not prophesy in your name and in your name cast out demons and in your name perform many miracles? Then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Leave me, you who practice lawlessness. Um, so God knows who are from the fake. It's not about the show. Signs and wonders are not the proof. And it's, it's about your relationship with Jesus there. He said there at the end. And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. You may have said things, you may have done things, but I never knew you. So he, God doesn't know them, but knows their deeds. Kind of an important point there. So let's look a little bit deep, deeper at a few things here. Not everyone who says, Lord, our, our traditions and our religious practice doesn't profit. See, a lot of times people go through kind of this daze in life of thinking that if they just tick all the right boxes, they're fine. You know what I mean? If, I, if I'm a good enough Christian, then I'm fine. If I just keep up the traditions of what the pastor tells me is right and wrong, you know what I mean? then I'll be fine. And what we see in Matthew chapter 7 is no, that, that doesn't actually profit. So then the question becomes, what is the will of the Father? Well, let's think about this very seriously. Judging from Matthew 7, 21 through 23, let's look at this. But the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven will enter. Many will say to me, didn't we prophesy, cast out demons, perform, perform miracles? So then we can safely say this. The will of the Father is not prophesying, casting out demons, or performing miracles. Isn't that a safe conclusion? Because if it was the will of the Father, then wouldn't they be entering? Doesn't that make sense? The good works are not the will of the Father. Now see, that's that's kind of important because context is everything. And one of the things that's important is that the Bible very clearly says that God has planned good works and 
for us to do. But in the context of Matthew 7, the will of the Father is not are not those good works. Which brings us to another important point. Remember, right before this, he was talking about how you can know them by their fruit, right? We looked at that a month ago. So then good fruit is not prophecy, casting out demons, or miracles. This is, this is kind of important. Now let's tie things together here. The will of the Father is what then? Knowing him. The will of the Father is that we know him. Look at this. Who does the will of my Father who is in heaven will enter. Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy? So these are the things. And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Leave me, you who practice all this. And so what was the point of contention that, that Jesus himself cast them out from entering into heaven? They didn't do the will of the Father. And what was that? I never knew you. So then the will of the Father in the context of Matthew 7 is that we uh -huh. know God. That we know God. Very important point here. The will of the Father is knowing him. Good fruit? What, what is good fruit? Good fruit is living for him. But see, it's not good fruit if it's something that doesn't come from the heart. If it's something that comes from us trying to manipulate God or manipulate others, that's not good fruit. Even though we're doing the same things, the good things become bad things because of what's inside. That means you could literally spend the rest of your life feeding orphans and it not be good fruit. That's a very powerful message that Jesus is saying. And what's even more troubling is who he's saying this stuff to. He's saying this around where Pharisees can hear. He's saying this around where, where people who want to follow him can hear. And what they're hearing is, you're not as secure as you think you are by your own goodness. <laughs> well, that's troubling because we want something that we're in control of. That's one of the biggest reasons why I think that the Bible came from God and not from men. Men don't like the idea that I am not in control of my own destiny. We want something where we can attain that. If you look at all religions in the whole world except for Christianity, it's about what I can attain by my own power. All of them. But in Christianity, there's this idea that you can't. It is beyond your control. It's very terrifying. But that brings us to a very important point that I want to make sure to emphasize. I'm going to bring it up two times tonight. We all sin. Nobody is perfect. Why is that important? Because we just talked about how good fruit is living for him. So that would imply that any time that we're not living for him, we are false. See what I mean? That's what that seems to imply. But it's very important to remember that, that we all sin. So I'll read it one more time before we go into the next part. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. But the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven will enter. Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and in your name cast out demons, in your name perform many miracles? And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Leave me, you who practice lawlessness. So how can God not know him, not know them? This, this for a lot of people is, is a little bit confusing. Doesn't God know everything? Well, know is more of a term that the Bible is, is using here for like kind of like an intimate knowledge of. When... When Jesus is saying, I never knew you, what he's saying is, we never had a relationship. I, I, he knows us. He knows what's in our heart. He, he knows about us. He knows all that. God can't know us any more than he knows us, in the literal sense. But how this word is being used is, is not being used in the, in, in the little sen literal sense. It's being used in the sense of relationship. I never knew you. It's like when the Bible mentions that a husband and wife went in together and had sex. It doesn't say, then they went and had sex. It says that they went and they knew each other. You know what I mean? And the idea here is not necessarily the emphasis on the sex, but the intimacy. And so the idea here being on people that God is in communion with, in, in relationship with. So the, these are people who are not, do not have an intimate knowledge of God. Um, so the one who follows Jesus would then be someone who knows him. Um, and I mean obviously truly following, not, not just trying to make it look good. So knowing is shown by our obedience, not by our works and not by our words. That's exactly what Matthew 7 just said. They'll say this, and then they'll say, but we did this. And so it's not by works or by words. It's by that obedience um, to Jesus. So then by implication, those who aren't following God are workers of lawlessness. Well, so then that's kind of a big statement to make. Think about this. You have sweet old granny, um, who's not a Christian, 
can you really call her a worker of lawlessness? See what I mean? Like, it's one of those things that's troubling to our conscience. And so that brings up the question, well, what about good people? Well, we'll look at that, and uh, in, in when we're done talking about the fake, we'll look at the idea of good, but not yet. So just kind of put a pin in that. Um, we'll come back around to it uh, in a couple weeks. Um, those who live in sin do not know God, although all sin. So what that means is that everyone's going to sin. Everyone's going to mess up. You, you're not perfect. No, nobody's perfect. Um, let's say you've really gotten. Uh, let's say you've really gotten a hold of, of, of something that you you do all the time. Let's say you lie all the time, and you've really gotten a hold of it. Does that mean you're never ever going to lie ever again? Well, I mean, probably not. I mean, you're you're probably going to mess up. I mean, you shouldn't try to mess up. You know, and 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 when you mess up, you should obviously still take it to God. Absolutely. But the idea that you're just going to stop messing up is just naive. It's like it's like. Relapsing into your own addictions, or right? Relapsing versus ha versus having, you know, uh, uh, let's just say a one-off. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Like um, that—that's a good example. Like if I'm shooting up cocaine every day versus um, trying it once. Uh, yeah, ha you know, every everybody's gonna mess up, and yeah, I mean, I I'm not trying to condone a sin, but I hope you guys see what I'm saying. Th those who live in sin do not know God, so. Um, not that, not that. Now, here's another thing I need to, need to kind of clarify. Sometimes a Christian will struggle with a sin for a prolonged period of time, <coughs> something that they don't immediately get a hold of. That doesn't mean that they're not a Christian. It just means that they're struggling. Um, so God knows about them and knows everything. But one thing I want to point out from Matthew chapter seven. You're right. Yeah. Okay. From Matthew seven, notice how Jesus Himself is the one bringing punishment. See, at the beginning of it, it says, not, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom, but the one who does the will of my Father. But did you notice how it just switches? You got it? Yep. Okay. But you notice how it switches from not everyone who does the will of my Father, so that would make it sound like then I will declare to them, my Father never knew you. But he doesn't say that. See, not everyone, uh, but the one who does the will of my Father, then I will declare to them, I never knew you. He doesn't say, my Father never knew you. This is very important because of this. Jesus himself is the one bringing punishment. Jesus has just made an, made an overt statement that he himself is God and is the one who is bringing about punishment. Now, this is important because, remember, a lot of times people will tell you that Jesus is all love and all that stuff. Well, yes, absolutely Jesus is love, but that doesn't mean that he's not also uh, the ruler. So let's tie it all together. The next verse after these verses that we looked at says, Everyone who hears these words of mine and acts on them, um, is, he says, will be like uh, the guy building, building a house, right? One guy says, okay, let's build it on sand. It's foolish, stupid. The other guy builds it on rock, and it stands. Okay. So what words are he talking about when he says, everyone who hears these words of mine? Well, he's, it, seems to be, it seems that he's talking about the Sermon on the Mount, which is Matthew chapter 5 through 7. Where he, you know, he's talking about things like the golden rule and seeking his kingdom and how we treat others. Now, if you look, that all looks like salvation by works, doesn't it? Because he just said, everyone hears these words of mine and acts on them. But what he actually said was, if you hear what I'm saying and you're putting into into action, that's a wise thing to do. He didn't say you will earn your salvation by that. Kind of an important point to make. And then uh, next off. Now, I, I wanna, I'll come to it right here, so put a pin in that, and we'll come right back to that. Doing those good things do not ensure salvation. If you remember from the passage that we just read, it said, well, did we not do those? Did, were we not doing good things? So obviously, doing the things themselves will not bring about salvation. And um, he also said in the passage we looked at a month ago, you will know them by their fruit, which obviously Jesus is talking about, about the way that the inside has a way of coming out onto the outside. So... Um, no, it is not by salvation. Um, now, Jesus does make the statement in, in here, and don't remember the exact reference, but if you read through Matthew, uh, there at the Sermon on the Mount, I believe is where he says it. He says that, I, uh, that our righteousness must surpass the righteousness of the Pharisees. Now, this was a very troubling phrase because they were doing all the things right. What was wrong was their heart. Now, why this is important is because Jesus is the fulfillment of the law. And if you read through Matthew and you read through the books of the law, you can see that the point that Matthew's trying to make is that Jesus is the fulfillment of the law. He's what the law was looking forward to. He's the conclusion of it. The argument is, is, is this. 
He is therefore the hope of salvation. Jesus is the hope of salvation, and that's the whole point of everything, everything he's been saying here. So what? So how? Going back to Matthew seven, how can we? How can we um, find ourselves not not saying I never knew you by by our relationship with Jesus? That's the whole point of all of this. So the external, the, the things we do on the outside, isn't the be-all and end-all. It's not all about our appearance. Trust and obedience to God, which produces good works, is. It's not just outward. It's about the heart. So it's all about the heart. You, you, you won't know f the false. You won't know false, false words, false teachers, false prophets, fal uh, false teachings. You won't know those things by their words, their appearance, or their good works. Now, I'll pay attention to this. You won't be able to know the false by the words, how they look, or their good works. Isn't that everything that people kind of focus on? Well, they sound real good. I know many people. I'm not picking. I'm not picking on one guy. I, I, there's many people that I've heard this about. But during the election in 2012, I guess it was, I heard many people say, "I'm voting for President Obama because he uh, sounds real good." Once again, I'm not condoning or condemning. Uh, but my point being, that was what they focused on was the words um, or their appearance. How many people do you see who, oh, I like the way he presents himself. I'm voting for him. Um, um, or their good works. What, what, what do people do when they want votes? They go out and they go, and they go take pictures of them shaking hands with people in the community. Oh, look at all the good things I'm doing. That is everything that people focus on. You will instead know the false by their heart. And because the heart will produce bad fruit. So then that this brings up a very, very big problem. You can't judge a person's heart or their motives, can you? Nope. So how can you know the false by their heart if you can't actually judge a person's heart or motives? It's very difficult, isn't it? You see you see the problem. It's a bit of a conundrum. But you can be aware of the fruit that they produce. You can't judge somebody's heart, but you can judge somebody's actions somebody's words and although they may come off w real good um, you have to pay attention to what they're saying and really really listen because they're gonna make it sound really good really good so just think about this over the week and we'll, we'll this is where we'll pick up next week if a pleasant personality or working miracles acts of service Smooth sounding words, a person's status, their appearance. If none of those are the marks of the real, what is the mark of the real? I don't want you to answer, I just want you to think about this for the next week. It's not personality, the miracles, service, their smooth sounding words, their status, their appearance, none of those things. So then, what is the mark of the real? I hope that this is something that causes you to think over the week because this is something that I, I myself have, have, have greatly um, thought about for a real long time. So any questions or comments before we wrap up and get going on the game? Nope. Okay.